first hear the word Jaws, you know, I just think of a period in my life uh, when I was much younger than I am right now. And I think because I was younger, I was more courageous or I was more stupid. I'm not sure which. So when I think of Jaws, I think about courage and stupidity. And I think of both of those things existing underwater. Amity, as you know, means friendship. Be careful, will you? In this town? Tomorrow's the 4th of July. It's going to be one of the best summers we've ever had. A summer girl goes swimming. She tires, fishing boat comes along. This is not a boat accident. It was a shark. Beach is closed, no swimming. You yell shark. We've got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. A shark is attracted to the exact kind of splashing that occurs whenever human beings go in swimming. My boy is dead. Yes, you open the beaches on the 4th of July, it's like ringing the dinner bell. The shark swallow you whole. It's not going to be pleasant. You got any better suggestions? Shark! How was your day? Well, I had been thinking for years about a story about a shark that attacks people and what would happen if it came in and wouldn't go away and, and I hadn't done anything with it really and then in 1964 I read a story about a shark fisherman off Long Island who caught a 4,550 pound great white shark off the beaches of Long Island and I thought wow what would happen if one of these things came in and wouldn't go away and again, I didn't do anything about it until 1970 or 71, when a publisher finally said, that's an interesting story. I'll pay you a couple of dollars if you'll put it on paper. So that's how the idea began. One of the many accidents that happened with Jaws was the title. We had no idea of the title. I had thought for months about titles. I probably had a hundred. There were some of them were pretentious, the stillness in the water. Um, a silence in the deep. There were the jaws of death and the jaws of Leviathan and they all sounded dramatic or melodramatic or weird or pretentious and we came up to 20 minutes before production and my editor and I were having lunch at a restaurant and I said to him, we cannot agree on a word that we like, let alone a title that we like. In fact, the only word that we even think means anything, that says anything, is Jaws. Call the book Jaws. It may work. He said, okay, we'll call the thing Jaws. Both Dick Sanic and I saw or heard about the book at identical times. I heard about it from a small card in the fiction department of Cosmopolitan, edited by my wife, Helen Gurley Brown, which gave a brief description of the plot of this novel by Peter Benchley, and then said, might make a good movie. We both read it overnight, got on the phone with each other the next morning, and uh, said, look, we don't know how we can possibly do it, but we decided we we must have this, whatever it takes. This is the most exciting thing we've ever read, and we'll figure out later how, to, how we can make it. Had we read it twice, in my opinion, we never would have made Jaws, because anybody with a modicum of production knowledge would know there was no way to get a shark to leap on the stern of a small boat and swallow a man. How are we going to do this? Were we going to do it in animation? Who was going to do this? Coincidentally, the producers of Jaws had just been my producers on my first feature, Strickland Express, Dick Zanuck and David Brown. I asked them if this was something I could direct next. I just remember seeing a very large, you know, you know, a, a block of pages that said Jaws on it, and I didn't know what that meant. Jaws was, was it Jaws? Was it like a about a dentist? It was kind of an unusual word, and I remember borrowing a copy to read over the weekend. I, I had no idea this was about to become one of the best-selling books in the nation. And I read it, and I suddenly said to myself, wow, this is just like a movie I just made about a truck and a hapless 
driver called Duel. And, and, and of course, you know, I'm young and I'm stupid and I'm saying, Duel has four letters and Jaws has four letters. And they're both about these leviathans preying upon every man. And I said to myself, this is kind of the sequel to Duel, only it's on the water. Peter Benchley did a very good adaptation of his own novel. And then Peter kind of turned it over to me and said, here it is and do with it what you want. And at that point, I didn't quite know what to do with it because it wasn't the movie I wanted to make next. And I remember sitting down and writing the script myself and doing an entire draft myself from beginning to end. It was more of an exercise for me to become familiar with what I wanted Jaws to become. And it was an exercise that was very beneficial because I suddenly had a vision of the film even though I didn't possess the skills to write it. And David Brown suggested, and Dick Zanuck both suggested, that I go to Howard Sackler, who had written The Great White Hope. Howard Sackler specifically asked not to have credit. He only had a limited time to give to the film. And therefore, he said, I don't want credit. Sackler really broke the back of the movie and got me to say, yes, I'll make this movie next. I'm committing. And then came something that's not been recorded in the history of Jaws. The Screen Actors Guild contract was about to expire at the end of June of that year. It could have been 1973, perhaps, whenever the year was. And the studio decreed that no movie would be started that could not be finished by June 30th of that year because they didn't want to be struck. That is, that photography was, was completed. And Stephen said, I don't have a script yet. You're asking me to start this movie in April, whenever it was. I don't know, maybe this was February. He said, I don't have a script. And I said, who can we get? He said, there's a man named Carl Gottlieb. I'm thinking about him in the movie. I was hired first as an actor because if I was going to be on the set, I could at least help in the improvisations and the crowd scenes and finding stuff to do in the moment. That's how I was first on the picture as an actor. And then shortly after, I was hired to do the rewrites. Peter Benchley's novel included too much. There was just too much story for the film that we were making that had to have a really direct through line. We thought we had a chance to make a great popular movie. So toward that end, we tried to make the characters more human and believable, the tension more unbearable, and the suspense more frightening. Mr. Hooper, that's the USS Indianapolis. <laughs> You were on the Indianapolis? The Indianapolis speech, which for me is my favorite part of Jaws, this, this speech that Shaw gives about that, um, that was conceived by Howard Sackler, who only really wrote a short paragraph. And one day I was talking to John Milius and I said, could you make this longer? Because I think it's a speech, not just a couple of short paragraphs. 1,100 men went into the water. The vessel went down in 12 minutes. Didn't see the first shark for about half an hour. And so John sat down and he wrote page after page in longhand, I believe. When Robert Shaw read it, Shaw said, let me have a chance of rewriting it. So and then Shaw rewrote Milius, who had rewritten Sackler. And the speech in the movie is uh, basically Shaw's version of Milius' version of Sackler's version. You know the thing about a shark? He's got lifeless eyes, black eyes, like a doll's eye. When he comes at you, he doesn't seem to be living until he bites you. And those black eyes roll over white, and then... Oh, then you hear that terrible high-pitched screaming. The ocean turns red, and in spite of all the pounding and the hollering, they all come in and they rip you to pieces. We thought that to legitimatize the, the movie, there should be some real shark footage. Ron and Valerie Taylor were engaged in, in order to shoot real shark footage off of Australia, which they were well experienced in doing. Universal Pictures contacted uh, Valerie and I, and I said, yes, I think we can do the underwater shooting of live sharks in South Australia. So they flew me to uh, America and I spoke with uh, 
Steven Spielberg and met the production team over there and explained what I thought we could do with the real live great white sharks. But I explained that our sharks were only about 14 feet long, whereas Jaws was about 26 feet long. I had this idea of doing a miniature cage and putting a little person into a miniature cage that would have effectively scaled the shark up and added another, you know, nine feet to the overall length of the shark. And Hollywood sent us this little man and he, he couldn't die. He had spent most of his life riding horses, doubling for children in films like National Velvet. He'd double for Elizabeth Taylor. And um, we had to take him out and stuff him into a cage and dangle him into the cold southern ocean and have sharks, big, huge, monstrous sharks swimming around him. And he was very much afraid and we had a lot of difficulty getting him into the cage, which is probably quite understandable. We did have two little dummies because we were supposed to have somebody in the cage when the shark broke it up. We had Carl and he was much better, he looked better in the cage, he moved around a bit. We'd been working for about a week and we still hadn't um, got the shots of the shark attacking the cage. I mean, they don't normally do that, they'd rather attack a bait. One of them came in and he was a big strong shark and he swam around and we had the small cage, the half-sized cage, hanging on a bridle attached to a winch on the deck of the skippy. And he swam over it and got his nose caught in the bridle, tried to swim forward and became trapped. And uh, when a white shark is trapped, it goes crazy. And Ron was filming underwater and actually that's how we got that footage. And they used it. They wanted someone in the cage at the time but there was nobody in the cage, so they changed the script to suit that particular sequence because it was so dramatic. like the shark was destroying the cage that broke it away from uh, the small boat and the whole lot came tumbling down past me and crashed down onto the bottom. The shark got out and swam away. That was the scariest thing I think I've ever seen underwater. Our philosophy was that the star was the shark. When it came to the casting of the picture, we said, we have our star already. We don't need to spend a lot of money. Let's just get very good actors to play the roles. Then why don't we have one more drink and go down and cut that shark open? Martin, can you do that? I can do anything. I'm the chief of police. Roy Scheider was an interesting story of how I cast him because here's a situation where I was going after other actors and I was having trouble finding a name that uh, I liked and who would do it. And I remember I was at a, at a, at a party one night and uh, my agent brought me over to uh, be introduced to him and he was having a conversation with a writer named Tracy Keenan Wynn and as I approached him I heard a conversation that went something like this. We're going to have to have this giant shark come out of the water and land on a boat and crack the boat in half. And uh, then I was introduced to him, and uh, he said hello. He was very polite, very nice, very pleasant. And then as I was walking away, they picked up this conversation again. And I remember saying to my agent, as we walked away, I said, those guys, are, they got to be kidding. 
They gotta be kidding. A giant shark that cracks a boat in half. I thought they were loony. I told him the entire story. At the end of the story, he said, wow, that's a, that's a great story. What about me? I looked at Roy and I said, yeah, you know, you'd be a great Chief Brody, because I had loved Roy from uh, the French Connection. And that's how that came about. What are you doing out there? These are your people. Go and talk to them. Those aren't my people. They're from all over the place. What happened to the extra help we're supposed to That's have? not until the 4th of July. Between now and then, it's you and me. Uh, you know those eight guys in the fantail launch out there? Yeah? Well, none of them are going to get out of the harbor alive. I cast drivers basically because I, I loved American Graffiti. And I had seen him in that. And George Lucas was the person who sort of said to me, why don't you cast Ricky? Ricky Dreyfus. He'd be great. And he told me this movie that he wanted to make. And it was really a... A shocker. I mean, even as he was telling it to me as a tale, it was a great, exciting story. And I said, well, this, this sounds like it's going to be a great movie. I'd rather watch this movie than shoot it, because it's going to be a bitch to shoot. Then a few months later, I went to see the opening of a film that I had done in Canada called The Apprenticeship of Dirty Kravitz. And I saw myself, really, for the first time, and I had a heart attack. I had a total nervous collapse. I thought I was awful. And I, I figured that I'd better get a job really soon. So I called Stephen and I said, if you still want to offer me that job, I'll take it. And he said, yes. So in essence, I came crawling to Martha's Vineyard for the part. Damon Fisher, Marlon, Stingray, been through this piano way. Don't you tell me my business again. My first choice to play Quint was Lee Marvin, but Lee Marvin wasn't interested. My second choice was Sterling Hayden, who I thought would make an amazing Quint. He couldn't do it either. For, for I, I forgot actually what the reason was he couldn't do it. And then Dick Sound David Brown suggested Robert Shaw. It was their idea. Son of a bitch! Goddamn women today, they can't handle nothing. Young girls just quite smart. Like the grandmother's work. It's got to be Quint. This collection of... Colorful, isn't it? This scares me. Raised, Christ Almighty, you Don't use the fireplace in the den because I didn't fix the flu yet. Kids? The first person I, I cast for the movie, in fact, was Lorraine, who I had loved in a TV movie I'd seen her do called The Marcus Nelson Murders, starring Telly Savalas and herself, I believe, as Telly's wife, in that, and thought she was a very natural actress, almost improvisational in her style, and she brought a realism to the movie, a real realism to that family, which I wanted in the film. Roy was wonderful in that scene. He was, I mean, he just brings tears to your eyes. And um, seeing Roy work the child and Stephen allow the child and Roy to flow as organically as they did, that, that added so much to this movie. It was uh, an extraordinary touch. Give me. Give us a kiss. Why? Because I need it. Ellen is very clear to me and always has been. Roy Scheider, his character, feels guilt because of the children. I'm a mother, I'm a wife, and I'm Jewish. You know, what could be clearer to me than how to make somebody feel guilty? This is something that I do in my sleep. It's uh, what I've trained for. And I have two sons, just like Ellen Brody. Yes, yes. Want to take him home? Like to New York? No. Home here. Murray Hamilton I had just been a big fan of from from the FBI story with James Stewart and I just always wanted to work with him I don't know I just I was a big fan of his and saw him instantly as the mayor of Amity so it for, for me that was I didn't have to go through nine actors he was the first choice for that part, and I was lucky enough to get him. But as you see, it's a beautiful day. The beaches are open, and the people are having a wonderful time. Amity, as you know, means friendship. Amity Island has long been known for its clean air, clear water, and beautiful white sand beaches. But in recent days, a cloud has appeared on the horizon of this beautiful resort community. A cloud in the shape 
of a killer shark. one of the geniuses of david brown was to realize that he could play upon the egos of writers and actors and other people who were not in the movie business necessarily by convincing us that only by our appearing in the film could the film achieve its true greatness so he came to me and said would i consider possibly as a favor to him being in this movie so i said sure i mean this was pure ego why not be in a feature film i want to try that end again okay all right and there you have it two different opinions by two men of goodwill but here in amity it seems it's the public that's making up its mind on amity island this is alan craig all right Murray, that'll do it save it when it came down to where we would shoot this film, uh, we sent Joe Alves, our production designer, out with the team to give us some ideas and some photographs and pictures of where this town should be shot. And one of the places was the island of Martha's Vineyard, which, believe it or not, had never been photographed by a feature film before. They had very strict rules and regulations there. Martha's Vineyard didn't particularly care for a movie invasion. They didn't like to see an artificial shark parked in a channel where their homes faced it. The real attraction of Martha's Vineyard you couldn't see with the naked eye. It was the fact it was the only place on the East Coast where I could go 12 miles out to sea and still have a sandy bottom only 30 feet below the surface of the water where we could put the shark's blood and where the mechanical shark could could function. It was very important that no matter what direction my cameras turned, I didn't want to see land. My fear was the minute the audience saw land, they'd say, look, this is getting pretty intense out here. Just turn the boat around and go toward that land that we keep seeing in your movie. I wanted the audience to feel very cut off, like they couldn't just run back to shore because there was no shore to run back to. Full throttle, get me right up alongside it! They can't rip it up that high, it's not gonna take it! A lot of things, you know, forced me into making certain decisions that did not involve the shark uh, because the shark was not working for a long time while we were on Martha's Vineyard in production. But that particular scene was conceived because even in the book, you, the book does describe the shark before you see the attack. I thought that what could really be scary was not seeing the shark and just seeing the water because we all are familiar with the water. Very few of us have been in the water with a shark. But we've all gone swimming. And the idea of this girl going swimming and the audience going swimming with her would have been too extraordinary if, like a leviathan, the shark had come out of the water with its jaws agape and come down on her and it would have been a spectacular opening for the film but there would have been nothing primal about it it would just have been a, a monster moment that we've all seen and i really wanted to do it without seeing the shark in that that case and i wanted the violent jerking motions to just start to trigger our imaginations into either thinking about what's happening below the surface of the water line or blocking what was happening below the surface <coughs> The first jerk down, Stephen did. He had a cable that came to the front of my stomach and went to a anchor that was laying on the bottom of the ocean. And then he just sat, and when he wanted that pull, he just would pull. Ah! Ah! 